Let's open our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 9. And uh, we've been going through the, the building of the temple, the equipping of the temple, Solomon's temple, that is. And my intention is to do ta- chapters 9, 10, and 11. I don't know if I'll get through them. There's probably more verses than dialogue through this. Just a, there are a lot of names and a lot of uh, points to be made here. But we're, uh, we're going through that period of time where Solomon is becoming very famous around in that area of the world. Uh, probably, from what I can see in Scripture, the, the wisest man that God has ever anointed blessed above all, and will watch his rise, his popularity, and his demise as he turns his way, uh, his eyes away from the Lord. So let's look at the first three verses of 1 Kings 9. And it came to pass, when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord, and the king's house, and all Solomon's desire, which he was pleased to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, as he had appeared unto him at Gibeon. And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever. And mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. So it's interesting. It says that he appears to the Lord appears to Solomon a second time. And it's the second time in 1 Kings here. Back in chapter 3, verse 5, it said, In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Can you imagine the Lord coming and saying, What do you want? What can I give you? I mean, I don't know that I'd handle that well. But uh, uh, Solomon did. And he tells Solomon now, in the second time that he appears to him, he says, I have heard your prayer and your supplication. He's, he's heard, I've heard your prayers. I realize that you're in submission to me, that you're bowed over to me, and I've heard all that. And we can know that God hears our prayers, that God loves us. We know he does, that he, he thinks about us. We're on his mind. Even though we're in the time zone and he is in the timeless zone, he loves us, he thinks about us, he hears our prayers. In fact, if he's an all-knowing God, he knows our prayers before we even think them, before we even say them. And there there are times when people come into doubt about whether or not God's really there. Solomon is uh, is uh, hearing from him. As the man said in Mark 9:24, just a part of that verse, Lord, I believe... Help thou mine unbelief. Sometimes we're in that. Yeah, Lord, I believe in you, but I'm not sure if you're going to come through with this one in the way I think it ought to come out. Now, you probably don't ever think that way, but sometimes I do. And sometimes we, as we're, we're talking to the Lord, sometimes we might pray outside his will. James said in chapter 4, verse 3, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss to, that you may consume it upon your own lusts. And when we pray, oftentimes we pray for ourselves. We intercede. We, uh, we pray for others. And then there's that prayer of praise where we just thank God for what's going on. But we do need um, what he said in verse 3, the prayer that you have made before me. It's interesting because what he's saying is you're presenting that prayer. This is before God, not before men. Our prayers are to God. And sometimes I've been in groups of people where, where people pray kind of to hear themselves speak. And that's not what the Lord wants. He wants us talking to him, not to one another. We're not here to impress one another. God knows who we are. And it's interesting, he said in verse 3 also, I have hallowed this house which you have built. I've given you the dimensions. I've shown you what I want you to do here. Uh, but I've built you this house. We have a church building. It's actually a warehouse, you know, where we meet. We have our sanctuary within the warehouse. But we have a church building, uh, a, a place where we can gather. But not because God lives here. It says that God doesn't live in houses made with hands. But we gather here anywhere that we might be, hit, uh, be, uh, uh, be able to meet with God because it's God's heart to meet with his people. And actually, we bring the Holy Spirit in with us. God's not in this building. We, we bring him in, in the presence of the Holy Spirit. In verse 4, let's read through till 9. Now, he's going to give <clears throat> Solomon some conditions here now. If thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, 
in integrity of heart and in uprightness and do according to all that I have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and my judgments. Now think about David. David was a sinner too. Remember the Bathsheba incident? So David wasn't a perfect man, but he had a heart after God. And he was walking in God's presence as best he could. So he says, if you'll do these things, in verse 5, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, thou shalt, there shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. In verse 6, you don't want to see a but there, because that's a turn. There's a turn in the thought here. But if you shall at all turn from following me, if any, just a little bit, you or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them. That's pretty severe. And this house which I have hallowed for my name will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. In other words, I'm just talking about you. And, and at this house which is high, everyone that passes by it shall be astonished and shall hiss. And they shall say, Why has the Lord done thus unto this land and to this house? And they shall answer, because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought forth their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have taken upon, and, and have taken hold upon other gods, and have worshipped them, and served them. Therefore hath the Lord brought upon them all this evil. He says, if you will do this, I will do this. If you will do these things, and I'll establish you. I'll get you firmly rooted and grounded, and I'll bless you. It, it, but it was God's covenant with them that he's making with them. But it's a conditional covenant. If you'll do this, then I'll do this. If you'll do this, this will put some feet to your faith so that you can show people who you are. And uh, But we call this the if-then statements. The computer programs use them all, all the time. If, if, if this happens, then this will happen. That's what this is, an if-then statement. Um, if the first condition isn't satisfied. He said, if you don't do this, then the second can't happen. And as much as we think of God as a, as a loving and a gentle and a, and a soft God, in a sense, he is. He's a loving God. He loves us unconditionally. He's also a just God. And when he says something, he does it. And so the Jews, they had this conditional relationship with God where if you do this, I'll do this. For believers in Jesus Christ, our security is based upon faith, believing in the atoning death of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that he has done, that we believe. So we don't, and out of that faith, is, and the Holy Spirit is poured through us, and then our hands and feet get to work and do the work of God. So we're, in, in one sense, I guess you could say well, it's a conditional relationship, too, because we have to believe in order to be a, a, a part of the body of Christ. Uh, verse uh, 10. And it came to pass at the end of 20 years, <clears throat> when Solomon had built the two houses and the house of the Lord and the king's house. Now Hiram, the king of Tyre, had furnished Solomon with cedar trees and fir trees and with gold according to all his desire. That then King Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. And Hiram came out from Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had given him. And they pleased him not. And he said, What cities are these which thou hast given me, my brother? And he called them the land of Kabul unto this day. And Hiram sent to the king six score talents of gold. So Solomon seems like he's rewarding Hiram. He's giving him the cities, but Hiram's not pleased. In fact, he calls them Kabul which means these are of no value to me and my people. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> Verse 15. And the, this is the reason of the levy which King Solomon raised, for to build the house of the Lord in his own house in Milo, in the wall of Jerusalem, and Hazor, and Megiddo, and uh, Gezer, 
For Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and taken Gezer and burnt it with fire and slain the Canaanites that dwelt in the city and given it for a present unto his daughter, Solomon's wife. And Solomon built Gezer. Actually, he rebuilt it because it had been burnt down. He rebuilt Gezer and Beth Horon, the nether, and Baalath and Tadmor and the wilderness in the land. In all the cities of store that Solomon had, and the cities of his chariots and cities of his horsemen, and that which Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, and he called them the land of Kabul unto this day. And Hiram sent to the king six talents of gold. So I just read that, didn't I? Oh, my, uh, you know what? I'm reading off my tablet here, and it's, uh, it, uh, all right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. Verse 19 through 23. Okay, so uh, in all the cities of this, of store that Solomon had and cities for his chariots and cities for his horsemen, that which Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem and in Lebanon and in all the land of his dominion, and all the people that were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, which were not of the children of Israel, their children that were left after them in the land, whom the children of Israel also were not able utterly to destroy, upon those that Solomon levy a, a tribute to bonds to bond servant service unto this day. But the children of Israel did Solomon make no bondmen, but they were men of war, and his servants, and his princes, and his captains, and rulers of his chariots, and his horsemen. These were the chief of the officers that were over Solomon's work, 550, which bear rule over the people that wrought in the work. So let's see here. Bear with me. So there were a group of people that Solomon is using for, as servants. Then in verse 22, he says, But of the children of Israel did Solomon make no bondmen, but they were men of war and his servants and his princes and his captains and the rulers of his chariots and his horsemen. These were the chief of the, of the officers that were over Solomon's work, 550 that bear rule over the people that wrought in the work. So the, he had people that were serving as bond servants, but he couldn't do that with the Israelites because you couldn't make Israelites into slaves. There's a law back in Leviticus 25. I'll read you two verses, 39 and 40. It says, If thy brother that dwells with thee be poor... And is sold to you, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond servant, but as a hired servant. So, so we had people that were hired servants. There were some who were bond servants or slaves. Verse 24, but, but Pharaoh's daughter came up out of the city of David under her house, which Solomon had built for her. And then did he build Milo. And three times a year did Solomon offer burnt offerings and peace offerings upon the altar which he built unto the Lord. And he burnt incense upon the altar that was before the Lord. So he finished the house. And King Solomon made a navy of ships and Ezion Geber, uh, which is beside Eloth, on the shore of the Red Sea and in the land of Edom. And, uh, and Hiram sent in the navy his servants, shipmen that had knowledge of the sea with the servants of Solomon. And they came to Ophir and fetched from thence gold, 420 talents, and brought it to King Solomon. Uh, we see more of Solomon's accomplishments here. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter gets a house, and uh, he's, uh, he develops a navy here with, with Hiram's help, and uh, Solomon's wealth is just increasing and increasing as he grows in uh, fame, really. Um, some... I, I ran across a, an interchange with D.L. Moody because, uh, you know, as a lot of times when we're reading scriptures, we sometimes we don't quite know, know what to make of them, don't know how to interpret them, don't know what they're meaning and all. So he was, he was asked by someone years ago about a very difficult verse in the Bible. And he was asked, Mr. Moody, what do you do with that, that verse? And his answer, well, I don't do anything with it. Well, how do you understand it? He says, well, I don't understand it. Well, how do you explain it? Well, I don't understand it. explain it. He said, well, what do you do with it? He says, I don't do anything with it. He says, well, you don't believe it, do you? He says, oh, yeah, I believe it. Yes, I believe it. Well, 
you don't accept anything you can't understand, do you? He says, yes, I certainly do in God's word. There are lots of things I do not understand, but I believe them. I do not understand, I do not know anything about higher mathematics, but I believe in them. I do not understand astronomy, but I believe in astronomy. A man told me a while ago he did not believe a thing he had never seen, and I asked him if he'd ever seen his own brain. <laughs> and uh, and uh, when a, um, a liberal once came to him and said, uh, well, you know, the, this whole story of Jonah, the book of Jonah is a myth. And he says, what do you think of that? He says, well, I'm going to stand with Jonah. <laughs> And what we can do is stand by the word of God. And that's what we do as we go through the scriptures. We go through 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says that we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So that's uh, we can trust in God's word. All right. Let's see. I have better fortune here with the next verses. And uh, for chapter 10, <clears throat> pardon me. When the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. That means to test someone. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices, with very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all, uh, all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom in the house that he had built, in the meat of his table, in the sitting of his servants, in the attendance of his ministers, in their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in my own land of of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not the words until I came and in mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and the prosperity exceeds the fame which I heard. Happy are thy men. Happy are thy servants which stand continually before thee and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord uh, loved Israel forever. Therefore made he the king to be judgment and justice. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold and spices, very great store, uh, <clears throat> and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these, which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Well, so uh, we see... As we go through these words of Solomon, we see in Solomon his, uh, that God has given a commission to the Jews to be, to be true to God. Be true to God, be a witness for me, and the world will come to you. It's interesting because what we have as believers, we have a commission from God also. It's to go to all the world. He'll be with us. And we go out to the world. In Matthew 28, I'll read you two verses, 19 and 20. He said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the, Father, the Son, and, and the Holy Ghost. And I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. <laughs> that settles it. In, in the, at Pentecost, uh, in Acts 1.8, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both. So that's what we are. We're witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. When John, I'm sorry, and John was speaking of Jesus. Jesus said, I'll pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. You know, when, when we give our faith to Christ and the Holy Spirit comes in us, it never leaves. He's with us forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. It, it, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That's, that's the comforter. That's the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we, because... We have the Holy Spirit. We're to go out equipped by God's Holy Spirit because Jesus doesn't send us unequipped to do things. Where he guides, he provides. We, we may feel helpless in our own strength, but God is able. He can use the bro most broken of vessels. We're called 
to righteousness. We're called to godliness. We're called to holiness. And the world notices that because we have God's Holy Spirit power. Verse 11. And the navy also of Hiram that brought gold from Ophir brought in from Ophir great plenty of almug trees and precious stones. And the king made of the almug trees pillars for the house of the Lord and for the king's house. Obviously big and tall trees. Uh, harps also and psalteries for singers. There came no such almug trees nor were seen unto this day. And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire whatsoever she asked beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. Now the weight of the gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. Uh, according to today's values, around $6.3 billion worth of gold, fair amount of gold. Beside that, he had of the merchantmen and of the traffic of the spice merchants and of all the kings of Arabia and of the governments of the country. And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went to one target. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three pounds of gold went to one shield. That's, in today's value, it's about ninety to $1,000. I made a calculation this morning. Every shield was about, in today's value, $91,000. He made 300 of them. That comes to $27 million worth of gold for these shields, okay? And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. You know, think about it. If in your own house, say, let's see, I'm going to cover something in gold. Well, no, I can't. I don't have any gold. Well, how about 300 shields? Well, you know, a, a shield. No, it's not. Think about it, the value and the 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 mark the craftsmanship it's amazing and, and then it says moreover the king made in verse 18 the king made a, a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold <laughs> the throne had six steps and the top of the throne was round behind and there were stays on either side of the place of the seat and two lions stood uh, two lions st stood beside the staves stays and uh, 12 lions stood there on the one side and on the other side the six upon the six steps there was not the like made in any kingdom and all king solomon's drinking vessels were of gold and all the vessels of the house of the forest of lebanon were of pure gold none were of silver it was nothing accounted of in the days of solomon for the king had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. One in three, once in three years came the navy of Tarshish bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes. In case you need apes and peacocks. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. And they brought every man his present, vessels of silver and vessels of gold and garments and armor and spices, horses and mules, a rate year by year. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen, and he had a thousand and four hundred chariots, twelve thousand horsemen, whom he bestowed in the cities for chariots and with the king at Jerusalem. And the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones, and cedars he made to be as the sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt, and linen yarn. The king's merchants received the linen yarn at a price, and a chariot came up and went out of Egypt for 600 shekels of silver, and a horse for 150. And so for all the kings of the Hittites and for the kings of Syria, they did bring them out by their means. Boy, think about this wealth. Silver, gold, clothing. This is raiment and, uh, and garments, uh, armor, spices, animals, and all in abundance, huge abundance. <laughs> 
I ran across a quote by Martin Luther. He says, I've held many things in my hands, and I've lost them all. But whatever I placed in God's hands, that I still possess. <laughs> interesting, interesting. And, you know, for us, you know, our priorities, where is our money spent? And uh, do we spend it on health aids, beauty? Today it's probably just rent and, and food, stuff and things, possessions, the Lord, you know. Um, John Wesley Oh, I think he was from in the 1700s. Uh, he had an attitude that's worth worthy of pondering. When he uh, learned that his house had been destroyed by fi- fire, he said, "Oh, the Lord's house burned. One more resp- one less responsibility for me." <laughs> that's quite an attitude, isn't it? Um, okay, I'm going to go through. Uh, let's hit chapter 11. And uh, but King. Solomon loved many strange women. Uh oh, see some trouble ahead. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, the women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and the Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away their, your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. Years ago in a Sunday school, a little kid said, yeah, Solomon, he had a lot of wives, and he had 300 porcupines, because <laughs> he didn't know what a concubine was. And his wives, and his, listen to this, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Asherah, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord. I hope the Lord never says that about us. We did evil in his sight. And went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. So he wasn't just listening and saying, oh, yeah, that's an interesting concept of a god, a little G god. You know, here's Solomon. Think of his wealth, his wisdom. He knew all these things in all different areas. And yet uh, Luke 12, 48 says, for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. And here's Solomon, he's got this incredible wisdom and wealth. And what does he do? He's a collector. There's nothing wrong with having a hobby, but don't make it women if you're a man and you're already married. We need to be careful what we collect. Solomon's collecting women like father, like son. David was had the same sin of the flesh. It led to his downfall. But it says they, they, he and they, they turned, uh, he turned his head from God. I like 2 Corinthians 10.5. It says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God were to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You ever thought about that? Not, not even letting our mind wander. Keep everything under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Verse 9. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel which had appeared unto him twice. You might think, well, only twice? I don't know. How many appearances have you had? How many have I had? None. (laughs) He's come to me. He's come to me in his spirit. I've heard his voice, not audibly, but I hear him speak to me at times. He's given me words of knowledge and words of wisdom and, and such. But to have him appear to me, no, that's a different thing. You might think, oh, only twice? Well, that's a pretty big deal. And the God, in verse 10, and, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Remember, he said, if you will do this, then I will do that. Wherefore, the Lord said to Solomon, for as much as this is done to thee, 
or done of thee, I'm sorry, if done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend, that means tear, pull away uh, the kingdom from thee, and I will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding, in thy days I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. Hebrews 10.31 says, It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Solomon in the tribe of Judah Solomon is, of, I'm sorry, of the tribe of Judah. He joins together with the tribe of Benjamin, so they have one alliance. And then the other ten tribes will follow his son Jeroboam, which we will see now. Verse 14, And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. For it came to pass when David was in Edom and Joab, the captain of the host, was gone up to bury the slain after he had smitten every male in Edom. For six months did Joab remain there with all Israel until he had cut off every male in Edom. Get the idea of that? Six months he's going through the whole area and killing every man. The Hadad fled. He and certain Edomites uh, of his father's servants with him to go into Egypt Hadad being yet a little child. And they arose out of Midian and came to Paran. And they took men with them out of Paran, and they came to Egypt unto Pharaoh king of Egypt, which gave him an house and appointed him victuals, food, and gave him land. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him to wife the sister of his own wife, the sister Tapanes, the queen the sister of Tapanes, the queen. And the sister of Tapanes bare him Genubath, his son. You, you won't find some of these names in the baby books, or, or in the baby name books, but uh, they're here. Genubath was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. And when Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept with his fathers and that Joab, the captain of the host, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, Let me depart that I may go to my own country. And then Pharaoh said to him, What hast thou lacked with me, that, behold, thou seekest to go to thine own country? And he answered, Nothing, howbeit let me go in anyways. He says, No, there's no reason. I just want to go. Just let me go anyway. And God stirred him up uh, another adversary, Rezan, the son of Eliida, which fled from his lord, Hadadezer, king of Zobah. And he gathered men unto him, and became captain over a band when David slew them at Zobah. Zobah. And they went to Damascus and dwelt, dwelt therein and reigned in Damascus. And he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon beside the mischief that Hadad did. And he abhorred Israel and reigned over Israel. I'm sorry, reigned over Syria. Um, so we see here the, the history of Hadad and Rezan as God stirs up enemies now to Solomon. Why? Because of ungodly behavior. See, God will sometimes use an enemy to judge sin within another person. He'll do that. And, uh, I mean, not all troubles that we get, uh, well, some of them are to teach us a lesson. Some of them are to strengthen us. Some, some troubles that come our way are simply to make us stronger. You know, if you're, if you're a weightlifter, you have to push against resistance. Well, oftentimes we have to push against the resistance of life to get stronger. And, but one of the things I've noticed that all of the resistance we have to go through is to draw us closer to him. It's to, it's to draw us closer to the Lord so that we'll pray to him, we'll reach out to him, we'll have fellowship with him and draw close to him. Verse 26, and Jeroboam, the son of Nebad, an Ephrathite of Zerida, a Solomon's servant whose mother's name was Zeruah, uh, a widow woman, even he lifted up his hand against the king. And this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Milo and repaired the breaches of the city of David, his father. And, uh, and the man Jeroboam was a mighty man. Of valor and, and Solomon, seeing the young man that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. So 
Jeroboam is given uh, responsibility in uh, verse 29. It says that it came to pass at that time that when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him in the way. And he had clad himself with a new garment, and they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it, tore it in 12 pieces, and said to Jeroboam, Take ten pieces, take thee ten pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give ten tribes to thee, but he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake, for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because that they have forsaken me, and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chidosh, or Chemosh, um, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes, and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David his father. So he's left two tribes for David and Jerusalem's sake, he said, and all because Solomon worshipped other gods. In Exodus 23, it's not like they didn't have uh, the the scriptures it says thou shalt have no other gods before me and, and that goes for us too we're not to have idols we're not to worship anything but our God uh, anything should be nothing should be higher than God and uh, let's see 34 I'm going to read to the end of the chapter howbeit I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David my servant's sake whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it unto thee even ten tribes. And and unto his son will I give one tribe, that David, my servant, may have a light always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. And I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desires, and shall be king over Israel. And it shall be... If you will hearken unto that, I command thee, and will walk in my ways, and do that is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David thy servant, my servant did, that I will be with thee, and build thee a house, a sure house, as I built for David, and, and give Israel unto thee. Again, conditional response here. And I will, for this, afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt unto Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon and the rest of the acts of Solomon and all that he did in his wisdom. Are they not written in the book of the acts of Solomon? In the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. And Solomon slept with his fathers, and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam his son reigned in his stead. So we see a lot of God's wisdom given to Solomon, but even God's wisdom, if it's not applied, doesn't benefit anyone. It's said that a a wise man learns by the experience of others. An ordinary man, woman, learns by his own experience. A fool doesn't learn by anybody's experience. And maybe you know some of each of those. But we have a wonderful opportunity to take God's word and and apply it to our lives. A lot of this is history. It doesn't directly apply to us. Except we can look at the lives of other people and say, wow, I could have gone in that direction. I may have made that same mistake. Or I I could do the wise thing that God is showing here. But it's such a a wonderful opportunity to hear and to learn and to apply the word of God to apply God's wisdom. And uh, when we don't do that, we're really wasting what we have. So let's pray. So Lord, we just thank you for who you are and and the word that you've given us, Lord, and the, the power that lies within it, Lord, and in your Holy Spirit, Lord. We know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, Lord. We, we have the Holy Spirit, Lord, and can overcome uh, the wicked one. So Lord, help us to remember the power that lies in us, Lord, the power of the Creator Himself, Lord, Your Holy Spirit. And uh, we have uh, 
your Holy Spirit leads us into the deep things of God, Lord, gives us wisdom, gives us discernment, gives us words of wisdom and knowledge at times, Lord. So, hallelujah, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us. And uh, thank you for the the mighty men of God and women of God that you've used in the Old Testament and the New, Lord, to continue this wonderful legacy you've left with us. Lift all this up in Jesus' name. Amen.